four through eleven. Is this on? <clears throat> In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mysteries of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it was and has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Jesus Christ. Because the servants of the gospel, by the gift of God's grace, gives me through the workings of his power, all <coughs> through, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boldness riches of Christ, and to make plain everyone's administration of his mystery, which was <clears throat> ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. In his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rule and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord. So be it. than Merle normally likes, but he did good. So be it. Okay, if we'll, you'll bow with me, we'll start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we can come and study your word together, that we are a people bound together by your spirit. Fill us with your spirit, lead and guide us into all truth. Help us to walk in step with the spirit and realize the gifts that the spirit gives us so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. Help us to live for your kingdom, your kingdom be come, and your will be done, Lord, which means that we need to deny ourselves and even take up our cross and follow after Jesus. We thank you so much for the, the promises that were in the Old Testament that were fulfilled with Christ Jesus and all the promises that we have as your people, as your children, Lord, in the return of Jesus Christ, that we will spend eternity with you. Um, and we just thank you and, and praise you. Help us to mature into uh, people that are more like Christ each and every day so that the world sees Christ in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to grab some drink because my throat's getting weak. <clears throat> Have you had a good week? I haven't. <laughs> I've had four babies with whatever this new flu is. And they, they just project out of every orifice in their body, and it smells horrible, and I smell just as bad as of yesterday. I hope I don't today, but if you smell something that you don't like, it's the kid still. <laughs> Do you need me? No. <laughs> oh, and my wife has just been an angel through all this. <laughs> She has been much more tired than I am, but it is something that you get up at 2 a.m., and by the time you get one changed and back in the bed, here's the other one standing in line. So, yeah, I know why you have babies when you're younger, because in your 50s is too old. Speaking of 50s, <clears throat> Hezekiah, we left off with him last week. He got 15 years more added to his life, but he still died at 54 years of age. I was thinking about that last night as I lay awake at 3 a.m. because I kind of wake up at 3 to 4 every morning with thoughts on my mind and I have to start counting sheep or reading God's Word or something to go back to sleep or I keep processing everything over and over. And I thought last night I would not even know Isabella and Ezekiel. Hezekiah died before I was that old. I would have never even saw them. He died young. All the scriptures talk about how he followed after David's ways and how the Lord blessed him and everything. And he was a good king, but I said last week that he didn't really sweep out everything and let the light be there. 
And I read from 2 Kings, and if you notice, then you read Isaiah chapter 39, and you read basically the same thing, because that's where we were in that story. <clears throat> so if you read this week, you should have read Isaiah chapters 39 through 55, and you should have read Mark chapters 10 through 13, verse 20. As I thought about this week, what to preach on, I studied a lot more of the Scripture and everything, and I didn't really get an answer to this question, but I'll throw it out there to you. God gave Hezekiah 15 more years. What did those last 15 years of Hezekiah's life look like? Scriptures don't tell us that much. But it looks like he started out his life a lot better than he finished his life. And I don't know, I went all over the place studying, and I'll try not to go all over the place now, but I went back to Exodus and went back to Deuteronomy and the laws God wrote, and we're supposed to write them on our children's hearts and everything. And then I thought about how his child turned out. And I think about his promises that if we do that, that he will be faithful to, to generation after generation. And I know that he's sovereign because we read in that story about how he turned back time even if you, if you read you didn't read that in Isaiah. I'll get to that in a little bit. If you studied about Hezekiah further, that was the sign that was given to, that God gave him that he, would, that he would heal him and give him 15 more years. He literally turned back time. But I think about the sincerity, the heartfeltness that we have, the, the realization of why we live and breathe and move, that we belong to God. And that we are redeemed by the precious blood of His only Son. Do we live like we truly believe that? And if we live like we truly believe that we would live where we would finish out our years no matter how they were, increasing in our faith so that our children do see the genuineness of our faith. Because the world out there is telling them, that they don't need Jesus, or it's Jesus plus, or whatever the other answers are. They need to hear and see the truth from their family. We need to be a light in this world. We need to have sincerity, compassion, and be focused on this and finish out this race well, as the author of Hebrews says. So I thought about some of these questions. What do you love? Of course, it was what do I love? What do I cherish? What do I love? What do I desire? What do I spend my time, money, effort on? What do you, I love the most? I mean, let's rank them up there. And, and what are the things that I am the most passionate about that because of that passion, you see it in my life? Am I living as a foreigner in this world because I know this is not my home? Am I living for the things of this world and the desires I get now? Or does the does, as, as Paul said, is there, are they rubbish to me? Do I consider them nothing? As something that I would throw in the garbage? And you know, as I get older, I, I look at so many of the things that I did spend time and effort and money on and accomplish, and then it does wind up in the dump, doesn't it? Or winds up in a storage building that you just pay storage on and you never use it. <laughs> the things that we considered worth something so much at some time. Am I loving the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength? And am I showing my love for others because it has to pour out of me that way, that I want equality, that I want justice, that I, that I want the love of God shown to men so that all men may come to salvation through Jesus Christ? Isn't that what the Scriptures tell me? Isn't that what Jesus did? And am I not supposed to forsake this world to follow after Him? So is my witness <clears throat> and my life advancing the kingdom of heaven on earth or not? Now that's the questions that I thought about as I read everything this week. And I'm going to read you some other scriptures this morning before we get into the scriptures that we read this week. And I did study some more and maybe you're drawn to do that while you're reading and stuff too. And it was difficult between the different times of taking care of small children. But hey, and then, yeah, like I said, my stomach hadn't felt good in a couple of days. And the nauseous has been there. But God helped me through all this. So I'm going to start with 2 Kings verse, chapter 20, where we did last week, where we left off. And I read you these scriptures from 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 15 to 17. The prophet <clears throat> asked, what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. And so many times 
we think of everything in this world as me, myself, and I. Hezekiah said, There is nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Am I proud of this? Am I bragging? How am I using this for God's glory? What gain is there in it? Am I giving God the credit because He's the giver of everything? Am I using what He's given me wisely so that I can bring about equality and justice, so that I can shepherd His people as He's shepherding me? Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Well, that's where I read last week. But we're going to read on a little further this week. Everything that he had as far as goods would be carried off to Babylon. But verse 18, and some of your descendants. Now that hit me. Because you know, the things of this world... The material things, they really don't matter. And as you get older, you understand that. And you've never seen a, a hearse pulling a U-Haul, have you? It just it doesn't happen. But my blessing and my heritage from the Lord is those four grandbabies that you do take care of. My son and those grandbabies and the ones that will follow after him. So why in the world would I would not want to write God's words on the doorposts of my house, on my life, of, of, of my heart? Why would I not want to tell them about Jesus when I get up, when I go to bed, and every time in between? I love it when we sit down to eat, and I, I, I'll admit it, I start eating before I pray. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I'll admit it. And one of them says, Pops, we haven't prayed yet. Oh, that is such a blessing. I don't know if they pray at their house. I don't know anything else. But I know when they come here, they see that they should pray, and they pray. They thank God for the blessings that He's given, even if it's some strange concoction that Sherry just threw together last night. But it's pretty good. <laughs> Whatever it is, we thank God for that, for daily bread. But verse 18 says, And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, they'll be taken away, sold into slavery, into captivity. Now, God's purpose is, is to redeem them back to them so that they'll repent in everything. But what if Hezekiah would not have done what he did? Would, things, would that picture look a little different? And they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought, and here's where my thoughts need to be, the mindset of Christ, so that my heart is focused on God's word, so that the Spirit reveals all truth to me, so that I walk in step with the Spirit, that I realize the gifts that the Spirit gives me. I realize that we're all together, tied together as one body. You have gifts, I have gifts, and we have a mission to bring the kingdom of heaven here to earth until Jesus comes and claims it. But he thought in his own mind, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? Now I'm going to say that again. This is what Hezekiah thought. I don't know where his thought process was, and you can think about this more. Will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? I don't know. That sounds a lot like some of the rapture theory that Christians talk about. Well, I'm not worried about when the rapture is because I won't be here. Well, you should be worried about when it is if you're going to worry about it because if you are still here, you're going to need to be witnessing. You're going to need to be walking firmly in the Spirit so that you don't deny Jesus come that day. If you're not walking in truth now, or you think you're going to walk in truth then, if you're not memorizing God's Scripture, what are you going to be doing then when you don't have the Word of God easily at your fingertips? Don't let it gather dust sitting on the end table. But he said, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? It didn't bring him to repentance at this point, but yet he did repent when he knew he was sick and going to die in the prime of his life, and he wept, and God heard his prayer. Verse 20, As for the other events of Hezekiah's reigns, all his achievements, and how he made the pool and the tunnel by which he brought water in the city, are they not written in the book of the annuals of the kings of Judah? That's the book of Chronicles, if you uh, don't know that. Hezekiah rested with his ancestors, and Manasseh his son succeeded him as king. Well, the rest of that story looks good. So I had to go look at, at Chronicles and read that again. 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became a king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His, wait a minute. Let's see. 
15 years roughly when he got sick, 15 more years. That's pretty close to 29 depending on exactly how many months were involved. God could have did it right pretty much in the middle. I'm not sure. But reigned 29 years and, and 25 plus 29 is 54. I would have been rotted in the grave by now if I was at the same point. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David done. In the first month even, boy, he started off well, of the, of the year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple and the Lord, of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and Levites, assembled them in the square on the east side, and said, Listen to me, Levites. Consecrate yourself now. Make yourselves holy unto God. Set apart for His service. And consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all defilements from the sanctuary. When Jesus went into the... And you see how my mind goes all over Scripture. When He went into Jerusalem, one of the first things He did was He cleared the temple again, didn't He? Our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord, our God, and forsook Him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on Him. They also shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. They did not burn incense or present any burnt offerings in the sanctuary to the God of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread and horror and scorn, as you can see with your own eyes. Verse 9, this is why our fathers have fallen by the sword and why our sons and daughters and wives are in captivity. Now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that His fierce anger will turn away from us. And he must have did pretty much that because there was peace so far in Hezekiah's lifetime these first 15 years. And what we read last week in Isaiah 38... Verse 1, In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, was, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says, Put your house in order. This is what God told him. This is the first thing he said. Put your house in order. What you're living for, who you're living for, how your li life shows, so that your children will see that and so that you will give God the glory, credit, worship, and honor that He deserves. Because you're going to die. You better do this before you're dead. You don't know what your number of your days are. You will not recover. Verse 2, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, Go tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayers and seen your tears. Must not have been faking it. He must have been genuine in what he prayed and genuine in how he wept. So God said, I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city, which means his children and his grandchildren, from the hands of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. He repented, he prayed, and God answered his prayers. But now to, to learn a little more, let's go back to 2 Chronicles and go to chapter 32, verse 24. <coughs> Excuse me. In those days Hezekiah became ill. Okay, same point. And was at the point of death. He prayed to the Lord who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. You wouldn't know about this unless you read this part. But Hezekiah's heart was proud. Ooh, you wouldn't have learned about that either. Hmm. And he did not respond to the kindness that God showed him. Therefore the Lord's wrath was on him, on Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his, of his heart, as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore the Lord's wrath did not come upon them upon the days, during the days of Hezekiah. We see clearly here from 2 Chronicles that Hezekiah's heart was proud. That's why he showed the kings of this world his riches, his palace, his armies, instead of God giving God credit and doing what he should do. Now I'm going to go back to 2 Kings chapter 20. Verse 6, I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you from the city from the hand of the king of Assyria. <clears throat> I will defend this city for my sake 
and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, Prepare a politis of figs. They did so and applied it to the boils, and he recovered. Hezekiah had asked Isaiah, What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that, he will go to the t that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? Isaiah answered, This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go for forth ten steps, or shall it go back ten steps? Now, we don't know exactly what that is, but let's just call it a sundial that tells time. As the shadow progresses, that's the day progresses. That's pretty easy to do, right? It would be difficult for the sun to just move like that and change that much. So Hezekiah said, It's a simple matter for the shadow to go forward ten steps. Rather, have it go back ten steps. Turn back time, right? Now, if God can turn back time, which if He can do any of the things that you know He's capable of doing, because He's capable of anything except lying and breaking His promise and not loving you and not, not preparing a place for you, <clears throat> then shouldn't we believe in Him, trust in Him, put our faith in Him? Shouldn't we worship Him? Verse 11, Then the prophet Isaiah called on the Lord, and the Lord made the shadow go back ten steps as it had gone down the stairway of Ahaz. At the time, Merodach Baladon, son of, a, of Baladon, king of Babylon, same king we have there, a little different name set, sent Hezekiah letters and gifts because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. Verse 13, Hezekiah received the envoys and showed them all that was in the storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine olive oil, his armory, and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all of his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Now you might not understand the pride in all these things in his heart unless you read all of the scripture. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 27. Hezekiah had great wealth and honor. He made treasures for treasuries for his silver and his gold, his precious stones, spices, shields, and all kinds of valuables. He also made buildings to store his harvest of grain, new wine, and olive oil. Now my thought process is all over the place, and I'm thinking of that rich fool that had built bigger barns for his grains that he had, and then yet tomorrow, or that very night, God required his life, didn't he? Boy, this story sounds so similar but God gave him 15 more years. Would he use them wisely? And I told you, I don't know the answer to that because Scripture doesn't give enough, but it looks like he started the 15 years really well. It looks like the last 15 years he didn't do so much, but God kept his promise and there was peace and security in the land. <clears throat> and he made stalls for various kinds of cattle and pens for the flock. He built villages and acquired great number of flocks and herds. For God had given him great riches. Now I'm back to thinking of Joseph and why God gave him great riches so that he could provide for his people and everything. Then I think forward to Jesus' teachings to the Pharisees and says, you've tied down to the least increment of your spices and everything, but you've neglected mercy and grace. Verse 30, it was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. He succeeded in everything he took. Boy, it's easy to realize how pride could come before a fall, couldn't it? Verse 31, oh, there's a but, complete opposite. But when envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign, oh, so... Time turned back not just in that area but all over the world, kind of like the star in Bethlehem that was seen everywhere. Time was turned back, and they came to Hezekiah to say, Is this your God's doing? And instead he showed him the riches of his palace. When the <clears throat> envoys from the rulers of Babylon came to ask him about the miraculous sign that occurred, God let, left him to test him and know everything that was in his heart. Boy, now I stopped and thought there. What's in my heart? 
How much do I thank God for every breath that He's given me, let alone the things in my life? And what about my precious, the blessings and heritage He's given me in my offspring? Verse 32, the other events of Hezekiah's reign and his acts of devotion are written in the visions of the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, the book of Isaiah, and in the book of kings of Judah of Israel, in 2 Kings, which we read. Verse 33, Oh, this is about a time to die, doesn't it? Plus 15 years, plus 15 years to reign, roughly. What did he do with these? <clears throat> Who was he living for? Who was he serving? Whose kingdoms was he advancing? Same questions I asked you earlier. Hezekiah rested with his ancestors and was buried on the hill where the tombs of David's descendants are. All Judea and the people of Jerusalem honored him when he died. And Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. If you understand much, if you've read scriptures, Manasseh was a wicked king. How, how, would he have turned out any differently if Hezekiah wrote the rules of God's laws on the door frames, if it was really in his heart, if he didn't let pride get in his own heart? I don't know. But I know that it says God tested him here and he failed because he showed him the riches of this world. If all I show, even if I go through all the motions and tithe down to the least increment, and I show my children that I'm more worried about the kings and kingdoms of this world, then who are they going to serve? It's not that hard to figure out. Legend, church legend has it that Manasseh was the one that actually sawed Isaiah in half. We don't know that for sure, but there's some indications that say that from Scripture. Isaiah chapter 39 then. <clears throat> Verse 8, The word of the Lord, You have spoken to me as good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought, we're back to that again, there will be peace and security in my lifetime. I don't know what that means. But I've got to think from a worldly mindset and from a prideful heart that at least I, when the rapture comes, I'll be taken away. I won't have to worry about it. They'll be good in my lifetime. But what about the blessings and heritage the Lord has given you in your children's lifetime, in your grandchildren's lifetimes, in your great-grandchildren's lifetimes? Exodus says that God will be faithful to a thousand generations of those who love Him. What do you love or who do you love is a better question. <clears throat> I don't know what Hezekiah meant, but I know that Scripture says that God tested him to see what was in his heart so that I know that his heart needed some cleaning out. I know that his heart was divided on whom he loved. And that means he was adulterous. And I know what all scriptures tell me about that. And I know how much God loves me, so why would I not be faithful to love him back with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, all of my strength, and love my neighbor as myself? How can I not? How can I let the sun go down and me be angry with even an enemy when I know Jesus said, oh, you've kept all the law? Well, let me tell you, murder, if you keep that anger in your heart, that's the same thing. Yeah, we can go marking it off. Paul said the same thing. I could mark off all the commandments till I got to number 10. It says, Thou shalt not covet, and then it hit him. That that's all he did. He was very prideful, but God changed his heart. So Isaiah was a warning sign. The letter of Isaiah is a warning sign, but it's also to repent and turn to God before future judgment. But it's also a book that tells of Jesus Christ coming. And as you read this, you should have seen all the Scripture, read all the Scripture that talks about Jesus coming and the things that He went through, the passion that He went through because of how much He loved you. <clears throat> a time of judgment and wrath is coming. So we've got to live a life that is genuine. God is in complete control at all times, and He will use whoever He wants to bring about His plan of salvation. He'll even use a worldly pagan king like Cyrus to become great and do things that do seek justice and equality in this world. If you study what Cyrus did, he did those things for people. And he was a pagan king that gave God glory. 
<clears throat> and what kind of saving grace do you and I have to know the name Jesus Christ and how are we living as a result? And it's not even us that transforms us and changes. It's the Holy Spirit living through us as we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow after Jesus. I'm going to go through a little bit of the Isaiah Scripture, but there's way too much for me to touch. Isaiah 40, verse 3, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight the <clears throat> in the desert a highway for our God. Verse 6, a voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? All the people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but because, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God <clears throat> endures forever. Which took me right to 1 Peter, which we're trying to do in uh, Sunday school, but we've got grandkids and treasure duties to do, so we're kind of split there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, because of who we are, because of what Christ has done for us, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set our hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ has revealed His coming, living for then, not for now. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from this empty way of life handed down to you. I'm thinking of Hezekiah. I'm thinking of what David realized. I'm thinking of Solomon's words where everything that he gained was all meaningless, meaningless, meaningless and how life was just a vapor. This empty way of life handed down to you from who? Your ancestors. <laughs> but, this, but with the precious blood of Christ is what you redeemed. A lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world. But was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believed in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God, not the things of this world. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. That's why I push so hard for you to be in a steady stream of reading God's Word, of studying it and applying it to your life. For all the people are like grass, all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Directly quoting from Isaiah there. Back to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. He rules with a mighty arm. See, His reward is with Him, and His recompense accompanies Him. He tends his flocks like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Verse 15, Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. Can you see all of this history that we see in the prophecy of history that was fulfilled in the book of Isaiah? With whom then will you compare God? Verse 21, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers to him. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of the world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them off like chaff. What, how did Hezekiah spend his final 15 years? Verse 29, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow weary, grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So why in the world would we not put our faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ and in nothing else? So how great is your God to you? How big is your sin debt that you can't pay? 
So then how amazing is your salvation? Is it amazing enough that you cry it out to anyone and everyone you can tell about it and you live your life the, the way that you show it? So are you loving Him with everything that you have and loving others to bring about equality and justice, to bring His will and His kingdom to earth? Isaiah chapter 41 to 44 tell of Jesus and what our response to Him should be like. Isaiah 45 through 47 prophesy a couple hundred years in the future of this anointed, and the word anointed is there in Scripture, only place you're going to find it for a pagan king, Cyrus the Great, to destroy Babylon, to destroy her false gods, to profess the God of Israel, to rule the world with justice, and to restore Israel as a nation, and to restore the temple. That's the things that God did through a pagan king, His anointed one. Isaiah 48, yet most of God's children still won't surrender their hearts and won't be a light to the world. <clears throat> Chapters 49 to 54, still God is faithful and there are so many prophecies about Jesus. As you read them, you read prophecy after prophecy there, a lot of that are repeated in the New Testament and what you saw in the passion of Jesus. So do you understand? Have you not heard? Do you believe? Will you believe and put your faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ? And then if you do that, will you choose to follow Him? Because that's the next step. You can say you have all the faith, the hope, and trust in the world. But if you do, then you will deny yourself. You'll deny the things of this world. You will follow after Jesus, which means that you'll joyfully go through and suffer in this world to bring, a, to bring a, someone to, to Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 55 starts out this way. Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. You don't need all these treasuries of your own in your own kingdom, do you? Because they're worthless in the kingdom of heaven. Why spend money on what is not bread then? And why labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen. Listen to me and eat what is good. You will delight in the riches of affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. Verse 6, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to God and He will have mercy on them. And to our God... <coughs> For he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. We'll finish up the book of Isaiah this week. You will see time and time again that God is in control of every single situation and you are not. That the things that he gives are blessings to you so that you can bless others, especially his love, his mercy, his grace that comes through Christ Jesus. You should be abounding with those because those things are true riches. Mark chapter 10. At the end of chapter 9, Jesus warns against causing others to stumble. And He says, everyone will be salted with fire. And He warns about salt that loses its saltiness. And I told you the main way that salt loses its saltiness is by being diluted. Hezekiah was diluted from being a good just king because he was prideful about the things of this world and the things that he had gained. He even built bigger barns to store those things in, didn't he? But they didn't add any more time to his life. Chapter 10 begins then with religious hypocrisy. Wow. These religious leaders, the blind leading the blind into destruction... They ask about the validity of divorce. If your heart was set right, you never would quarrel with other people. There never would be divorce. And I'm not accusing anybody or anything. God set up marriage before sin ever happened, that one man would be with one woman and you could see a perfect relationship, which gives plenty of examples of that relationship and we're a bride to Jesus Christ and we should be faithful. The reason that there are failed marriages, the reason there are divorces, is because we're sinful people, period. And thank goodness that God can pardon any of our sins, period. But why would you want to go justifying stealing or more murder or divorce or anything else unless you're trying to justify the things that are in your mind and in your heart? And we know that with the Pharisees. 
So Jesus answers them how? By bringing little children to Him. That He puts in His arms, hugs them, kisses them, and blesses them. And He says, Don't suffer the little children not to come unto Me, and the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. To have childlike faith, Papa, pick me up, carry me, provide for me, love for me. I trust in you. You can give me everything. Do you have that kind of faith in Jesus? Or do you trust in other things? And Jesus even says in verse 14, The kingdom of God belongs to such of these. And then He says after that, Truly, truly, or truly I tell you, or verily, 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 which means listen up. Okay? Anyone who will not receive the, receive the kingdom of God like a little child will struggle. No. Will never enter into the kingdom of God. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when many people think they will enter in and they won't. Even those who did mighty miracles in the name of Jesus. This should be a wake-up call. What should this mean to me as a believer? <clears throat> well, verse 17, right after that, as Jesus started on His way, a man ran up to Him and fell on his knees before Him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We read from 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and Isaiah to kind of get a grasp of Hezekiah's story and his life story and his 54 years, which is not that much, and, and he would have only had however many would subtract 15. My mind's not there. You can do the math. If God wouldn't have given him the additional time, and you don't have a clue how many days you have or how many additional days God's going to give you, So if we read this story, this true event, it's not a parable or anything, we'd have to look at the Gospel of Matthew and Luke also because it's found in three different stories, three different Gospels. If you do that, you'll get a little more insight. You'll find out that this man was a rich ruler. You'll also see that in all three Gospels that this happened directly after Jesus takes the little children in His arms, and you'll get a little more to the story there about how the kingdom of God belongs to little, that people, not little children physically, but those who come as little children with that thought process, but then they're supposed to mature, that I just fully trust you because you are my provider, you are my strength, you're the one that takes care of me, feeds me, everything else. Yeah, I might not like what you feed me, but you feed me. The child doesn't think about all the other things. He just comes to Pops or to his dad and says, take care of me. But in Luke, we learn that he's a ruler. In Mark, we learn that he runs. There was urgency to it. We also learn that he falls on his knees in a form of worship. The man calls Jesus good master or teacher, so he wants to learn. He understands that Jesus can teach him this way because he's at least a prophet, but he doesn't understand that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life. He thinks Jesus is good, and Jesus answers him with that. Jesus answers him that he is, he is God because he says no one is good but God. And then he tells this prideful man, just like Hezekiah, I'm putting that in the Scripture. He tells him that he knows how to obtain eternal life. Keep the commands. That's never changed. If you can keep God's holy standard, His commands, you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But there are none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. But the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. The one we pledge our allegiance to rather than our allegiance being half-hearted to someone else and it being an adulterous relationship. No wonder God doesn't like divorce. Why would we want to try to justify our sins of any kind? And Jesus says, I don't know if you've looked at these commands, and Mark gives them all, the others don't necessarily do that. Verse 19, you know the commandments. Oh, and he said, well, we'll get to that in a minute. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testament. 
you shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Now, we know there's more than ten, but the ten sum it up. And when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, the, Mount, the people were amazed at Jesus' teachings, how he expounded upon these commandments, which they already knew but didn't want to admit. Who wants to admit it if I'm angry that it's the same as murder? But let's see what he did here. Commandment number six. You shall, you shall not murder. Commandment number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Commandment number eight, you shall not steal. Commandment number nine, you shall not give false testimony. Commandment number ten, thou shalt not covet. Oh, well, if I don't covet, then I wouldn't be defrauding people, would it? It kind of goes hand in hand. And then he went back to command number five, honor your father and mother. These are all commandments that deal with loving others. Because if you love God, which we haven't even mentioned in this, you will be able to keep the commandments of loving others because God's laws will be in your heart. You'll love God with all your mind, soul, and strength, and you can't help but love others if this is your genuine love for God, if it's not divided with other idols. <clears throat> and Matthew writes after that, and love your neighbor as yourself. You wouldn't get that unless you studied these different accounts. The man was proud, and he said, I have kept these commandments. Boy, it sounds like Hezekiah again. I have done a good job. Look at my track record for the first 15 years. In fact, God has been with me in all this. But if I don't get rid of everything out of there, if there's darkness still in there, the darkness is wrestling with the light. The man asked Jesus, What do I still lack? And Jesus told him, the one thing that will what? Keep you from your inheritance, something you haven't earned for in the first place. What will keep you from getting that inheritance and having eternal life? If you want to be perfect, Matthew says, which means complete, not to just have head knowledge, but to have heart knowledge, then go sell all your possessions. What does that mean? What does that mean to me? It's not about money. Jesus teaches more about money than anything, but He's not teaching about money. He's teaching about the love in your heart, the trust in your heart for money. In fact, Paul warns Timothy, he says, the love of money is the root of all different kinds of evil. Let me go back to Exodus and read you the commands again. They start this way. You shall have no other gods before me. Oh, there's the root of the problem. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything. This man had idols. Hezekiah has idols. Alan has idols. Go ahead, put your name in there. Because we all have idols, we all fall short. <clears throat> you shall not make idols in the form of anything in the heavens above or the earth below or the waters beneath. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Jealous in the form of a relationship again between husband and wife. Yeah, I can be mad about a lot of things and jealous about a lot of things, but Merle, you come flirting with Sherry, I'm going to pop you like I've said before. So it's going to instinctively happen. I'm not going to mean to. I'm going to feel bad, but don't flirt with my wife. She's mine. She belongs to me. She committed herself to me, to be faithful to me, and I did to her. And how much more should our relationship to God be? So why would we want to cheat on Him with other things? I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on their children for the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. I don't hate God, but if I am in an adulterous situation, boy, that sure looks like hate, doesn't it? But God also says, showing love and devotion for a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commands. Two things, keep my commands and love me. You, if you don't love God, you, you're not keeping all the commands. You don't understand why you're even doing them. You're do, going through the motions. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who takes His name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. A promise of rest... Of, it, of inheriting eternal life. Six days we're supposed to labor on this world, and how are we supposed to labor on this world? Taking care of this world, loving one another, fighting for equality and justice, and those things. 
because we love God and love our neighbor. And the promise of hope and rest still stands today and is founded in Jesus Christ. So I ask these questions again, but I'm going to ask them this way. Who do I love? Not what. Who do I love the most then? Am I living as a foreigner in this world, loving the Lord more than anything else, and showing this love to others? Is my life a witness and a testimony? Is my life advancing the kingdom of heaven here on earth? Or am I just going through the motions and will it all be in vain the day I meet Jesus face to face? Will I hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? Or will I hear, depart from me, I don't know you? Mark 10, verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Just like we read in John where he lovingly waited to, to teach his disciples that further teaching and give them an example of washing each other's feet. He looked at the man with passion and said, You lack one thing, your heart's not right. If you go and get rid of all these idols in your life, they won't be fighting for your devotion for God. Then you can say that you can mark off commandment number one and two and three because you won't have any other gods before. You will love the Lord your God and you won't have to worry about facing His wrath. You'll go into His open arms and say it. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. Then you have to follow after Jesus after doing all this, because if you love the Lord your God and you love others, you can't help but to walk in the footsteps of the master, the teacher, that is teaching you the ways to truly live, that you can find true joy and true peace that you've never known before. But what happened in verse 22? At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Sad doesn't do the word justice. It's the same word that Jesus used when He grieved over Jerusalem because He longed for them to come to them as a uh, baby chick would come to its, to its mother hen, but they wouldn't. Jesus goes on to tell everyone, especially to His disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's harder than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. <clears throat> In fact, it's impossible for man to inherit eternal life for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. But it's not impossible for God. That's why He sent His one and only Son to die for you if you'll just put your faith and trust in Him. The disciples still don't get it, so they ask about being greatest in this world. And Jesus tells them how. <laughs> That's what's really amazing. If you understand all this, you get this whole picture and you're not living for this world anymore and you love God and you love others then become the least of these. Don't let the riches and the lies and the deceit of this world cause you to build treasures here on earth because you're building them on sand. And if you don't watch it, one day the flood will come. So is your foundation built on Jesus Christ and nothing else? That took me to the scriptures in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 4 said, In reading this, so this may have a little lot more light in the Scripture now, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, the things that weren't known before about Jesus Christ, the One, which was not made known to people of other generations as it had been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy people and apostles. This mystery is that through the Gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Wow, God's grace and love is so great. His plan of salvation is so awesome. Who can understand the ways of our Lord? Members together of one body and sharers together in the promise that comes in Jesus Christ. So I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the work, working of His power. You see how Paul lived before and how he lives now and how he considers everything garbage compared to the, to the knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ. Although I am the least, I am less than the least of the Lord's people, this grace was given to me, this grace to preach the, to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Jesus Christ, true riches, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery for which for, which for ages past has been kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be known, made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms according to His eternal purpose 
that is accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Does that scripture make a little more sense now? Is your life grounded in Jesus Christ? Is He all that matters to you? Is He your King that you've truly pledged your allegiance to? If He is, then are you loving and living and serving the King, the King of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the kingdom of God, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords? Or are you still wrestling with the things of this world? The things we don't like to call idols, but it's pretty clear that Scripture calls them idols. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you that you write your words on our heart when we become saved. We thank you for the spirit that indwells us and guides and leads us in all truth. We thank you for the work of Jesus Christ while he was here on earth. That he did not consider equality to, with you for something to be gained, but instead became less than the least of these and laid down his life and he went silent before his accusers when he could have called in a legion of angels to take him away but he died because of your love and his love for us that we might know your unfailing infathomable unexplainable love and that we don't need to know the words to say to tell others we just need to love you in our hearts and love others and the Holy Spirit will give us the word to say whether they're witnessing to our neighbor across the street or standing up before the judges and kings of this world facing martyrdom. Father, we thank you for the opportunity and freedom that we have now to proclaim your word. We thank you and praise you for all of this in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.